When was the last time you did some risk management CPD? What I mean by that is you went on a course to learn about, I don't know, how to be a more careful dentist, how to follow appropriate radiography guidelines or cross infection protocols, that, that kind of stuff. The stuff that's not sexy, unfortunately, right? Let's face it, you know, it's a composite of ears. That's what we want to go on. But, you know, this is super, super important stuff. Uh, and today's episode, which we streamed live to Facebook. So thank you, Dr. Lucy Nichols, for being part of that live. And so we do have a few shout outs here and there. And thanks to all of you who joined live on Facebook. It's on the Protrusive Dental Podcast Facebook page if you're not part of it already. Occasionally we do the live. And it was a great episode. These are the 10 commandments for staying out of trouble. And where they stem from is Lucy Nichols, who is a general dentist. She does some dental legal work. And as part of seeing lots of cases, she saw a pattern that dentists, us dentists, we're getting in trouble and we're tumbling down as easy victims, booby traps for falling into these obvious errors, which she wanted to share with you to make sure that we can be safer dentists and avoid getting claims and, and having legal troubles. So I hope you'd like all these 10 commandments by Lucy. So I only knew the first one and I loved it so much. That I said, okay, come on, let's do the podcast. Tell me the other nine. So we'll share them all with you. The protrusive dental pearl I want to share with you before we get to that main episode is kind of related to the first thing I said in my introduction, which is, do we make time for the right type of CPD. And on that topic of time, let's take a, a step back, right? Making time. We all have just 24 hours in a day, every single one of us, whether you're Richard Branson or Rishi Sunak, the new prime minister of the UK. I try not to get into politics, so I'll stay away from that one. But we all have a finite amount of time. And so really, we can't say that, oh, I don't have time for this, or I don't have time for that. Uh, and I used to say this, you know, I don't have time for this, or I'm too busy for that. And really, we should reframe how we say that. We should not say that I don't have time for something. Instead, we should say, I'm not making that thing a priority in my life right now. So let's say one I'm guilty of, okay, I've got the gym membership, I wanna go more, but at this moment, in this season, it's not that I don't have time for the gym, it's that I'm not making my health a priority. And so once you identify that, you have to then listen to yourself and then listen to your feelings in terms of how, how does that sit with you? So that thing that you're not making time for, whether it's further education, these not so sexy topics, or something in your life that you think you should be doing, but you're not doing it, that you've chosen to make it a low priority in your life. Once you recognize that you've made it a low priority, if that makes you feel happy, then great, keep making it low priority, never do that thing. But for like, like me, when I listen to myself say, you know what, I've, I've not been going to the gym in the last couple of weeks, I feel bad, and, and I don't feel good about it, then that is a sign that, okay, we need to change something. So it's not that I don't have time for certain things, it's that I choose to prioritize certain things of others and you gotta then listen to yourself does that sit well with you and then make changes accordingly so reflect on that Patrice Rati what are you making a priority in your life and what should you be making a priority well I appreciate that of all the things that you could be doing you're, you're joining me and my guests on Patrice's podcast really means a lot that you've joined us here today uh, whether you're driving chopping onions or watching on YouTube wherever you are or on the app this one's eligible for CPD just four questions after you listen or watch and then you can get your CPD certificate there's lots of premium content coming so next week uh, myself and Alan Bergen on the premium section have a whole one hour video of discussing full protocol step by step a full mouth rehab case that blew up on social media when Alan posted it so shout out to Satnam Upal who recommended this episode to, to come into fruition so that's coming next week exclusively on the app this won't be on YouTube it's going to be on the app only so download the Protrusive app on iOS or Android to download the app it's absolutely free but if you want to unlock a few extra features it is a subscription which I hope to deliver immense value to you anyway let's join the main episode with Dr. Lucy Nichols. We are going live now. So hello, Patrice Rati. Welcome to this very rare live uh, podcast I've got today. Dr. Lucy Nichols, who does lots of dental legal work. And you've seen the title. It's the 10 commandments, which uh, Lucy told me were her 10 bugbears, which I absolutely love. And I'm really excited to, to get stuck into these. Usually when we, I do a podcast with a guest, I, I kind of know the questions I'm going to ask already. But this is a little bit different, this one. So I'm very excited for it because uh, this is one that actually uh, Lucy will be leading in a way that she's going to be guiding me through her 10 bugbears because she does so much dental legal work and has been involved in this space. She's got these things which I think are going to really help us to stay out of trouble. And that's the, the purpose of this podcast, to help you all stay out of trouble. Help me stay out of trouble. I don't want to get in trouble. So Dr. Lucy Nichols, I know we both qualified from Sheffield at various times and you do, you've do done lots of dental legal work over the years. Just tell us a little about yourself before we get into the 10 commandments of staying out of trouble. Okay, well, hi, Jazz, and thank you so much for having me on. So, yes, I qualified from Sheffield, just like you, but a, a good few years earlier. And I did a year of vocational training there. 
and then I moved to London and did a couple of years of hospital jobs in oral and maxillofacial surgery. Then I went into practice, mainly NHS, mixed practice, but mainly NHS and did that for a little while. And then I started to become a little bit disillusioned. I wasn't enjoying it very much. I was starting to wonder if dentistry was the right thing for me. And I reached a point where I realized that the the question I had for myself was, is it dentistry that I don't like or is it NHS dentistry that I don't like? So I decided before I quit dentistry, I needed to try quitting NHS dentistry. And it can be quite competitive getting jobs in London. So I decided I needed to upskill. So I started doing an MSc in restorative cosmetic dentistry. And Was that um, Eastman or King's? Um, or? It was UCLan. Okay. And partway through that, I moved to working in fully private practice. And through the process of doing the MSc and moving to working in private practice, I started to really love dentistry again and was much, much happier. So that worked out brilliantly. Uh, It was a fantastic move. And I've really enjoyed working in dentistry since then. Um, It's always very common, uh, Lucy, isn't it? Uh, In terms of going through that uh, period in your career, we're thinking, is it actually right for me? And I hear this from dentists all the time. And I think you summarise it really well. And, and, you know, let's forget NHS and whatnot. It's whatever environment you're in. It could be a private practice, but in a toxic culture, a toxic environment. So it's really all about your environment. It might not be dentistry that you don't like. It's your environment that you're not in getting fulfilment from at that time. Yeah, absolutely. But also I find what's really important for me is to keep learning. So even just enrolling on the master's and starting that program just reinvigorated me. I suppose I and probably other people can as well. You get You get bored doing the same things all the time. So when you're learning and, and doing new things, it just, it just helps to keep it interesting. So that's what I've done, I guess. And over the years that I've been working in private practice, I've learned new skills. I started to do Invisalign. I started to place and restore dental implants. So, you know, I'm, I've always been looking for what else can I add to keep it interesting. And then a few and years ago... And then dental legal work? And then a few years ago, I started getting involved in, in dental legal work. I've got three children and it was something that allowed me to work part-time clinically and part-time from home. And that's led to like a really good work-life balance. Um, my kids are getting a bit older now, so that it makes it easy doing the work at home. So now about half my time is clinical work and about half of my time is dental legal work. And I love that balance. It's amazing to be able to sometimes work in my pajamas in bed if I want to, (laughs) which I never thought I'd be able to do as a dentist. And just generally, I I love the balance of having the clinical and the non-clinical. It works really well for me. Fantastic. Well, I just want to say some hellos. Hello to Suleiman uh, from West Cumbria. Uh, hello, Nani from Sheffield. Uh, uh, Nani, it's always a pleasure to see you on here. And guys, if you've got any questions, please come on in. If you're on here and you're enjoying the themes that we're covering, please share it to you know the Protrusive group or any other groups that you'd like to share it to, any friends that you want to join in. This live version. It'll go in the main podcast, Spotify, etc. But there's a, there's a magic about being live. So, uh, Lucy, when you spoke on the phone, you shared your first bugbear with me, and I, I loved it so much. So, Let's, why don't we start with the top 10 commandments which stem from your frustrations and the angle and the approach. And correct me if I'm wrong, Lucina, if I'm putting words in your mouth. But the reason you've identified them is because you almost got sick of seeing the people falling into the same, like a booby trap. People point the same traps. You must think, we'll save so much money by GDC and medical legal costs if, this, if this, these 10 things were done better. Would you yeah. agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So it seems to be things that maybe some of them are, people realize they should be doing. Maybe some of them aren't quite so obvious and they're the things that people maybe don't quite realize that they, they need to know. So yeah, I'm, I'm really hoping it will be helpful for people. Well, let's go with number one, which I loved. And I told you not to tell me the other nine because I wanted to do it live. So just remind me and, and everyone else uh, watching from probably in their pajamas right now. Uh, what is the number one bugbear? Not necessarily the most important, but just on the one on your list. Okay, number one on my list. Yeah, so number one is thou shalt take bite wings on children. So I, I don't know where this comes from, but it just seems to be a thing that dentists don't take bite wings on children, like literally none. You know, I see cases with children being going to the same practice every six months from when they were really young through six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, no bite wings at all. And when you have a child who has kept primary caries to the pulp and they've been going to the dentist every six months, then how are you going to be able to defend that in a claim if you've never taken bite wings? And I I think sometimes people 
assume or they might even have written in the notes that a child is low risk for caries but how do you know if you've not taken the bite wings because it might well be that there is caries there that's developing and progressing towards the pop and you just haven't seen it because you haven't taken the radiographs very true and you're eight times eight times more likely to diagnose caries through bite wings just uh, compared to just clinical examinations the stat I remember from from uh, Helen Rod at Den School at Sheffield so it is fundamental yeah. and I, I wholeheartedly agree with you I think we do as a profession need to take it it's as though we look at the guidelines for radiograph taking and we completely blur out and ignore the the, the children recommendations yeah, which mirror bizarre. fairly well the adult ones I completely agree it's a, it's a massively frustrating thing they mm. mirror them but it, the FGDP guidelines for taking bite wings are to take them for adults at 6, 12 and 24 months intervals for high, medium and low risk for caries. But for children, they're actually 6, 12 and 18 month intervals. So mm -hmm. they're putting mm -hmm. even more emphasis on potentially taking them more frequently for children than they are for adults. Yet what happens in practice is people just don't bother taking them at all. It's bizarre. So I don't know why, where why that do you think that from. is. I mean, is it just to save time and uh, just be quick in and out? I don't know. I mean, for me working in private practice, if I take x-rays, I get paid for it. So I understand that, you know, it, it's difficult for for colleagues who are working in NHS practice. You know, they take X-rays. It's not going to get them any extra UDAs to do that. And I, I understand that they are under a lot of pressure and that that's difficult. If you do take the bite wings though, and there is caries, it might allow you to get the three UDAs that help you to meet your target. And and also you're potentially going to avoid getting sued for, because you're not going to miss the caries. And you know, and, and ultimately, it's the right thing to do because it's proper patient care. So yeah, uh, agreed. So uh, guys, let's let's start taking bite wings in children. Uh, if your practice doesn't have uh, bite wing holders for children, that's the first thing to do tomorrow morning. Just get those ordered, right? That's a, with, you know the smaller films. Yes, smaller films. That's what I was going to say. I think what what maybe puts people off is children not being able to tolerate them. So if children aren't tolerating them, make sure that you've got smaller films. And I think even with the smaller films for children, sometimes what you also need is the little paper tabs because the the holders can be too bulky. And uncomfortable but those little paper tabs that they're, they're really quite comfortable I think that they're not too awkward in the mouth compared to what a film holder's like so I think children tend to get, get on pretty well with those you can manage to get bite wings on pretty young kids with those see I mean I'm, I'm just thinking that bite wings are nowadays uh, it's like a it's like a birthday present when you're 18 uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's almost like that really right yeah. so fine yeah. let's get let's yeah. get the correct films and correct holders guys in, and let's crack get cracking we know we need to do this let's do it yes and and do it at six six twelve or 18 month intervals as as you're meant to any guidelines to what is the, the lower limit in terms of like age three, age four? What, what guidelines can we use for the younger patient? Well, for, for the age to start doing it. the first bite wing. The yeah. first bite wings. Well, I, I think the idea is to do it once the, the contacts close, the, the interproximal contacts between the deciduous teeth close, mm -hmm. which is about the age of four or five. I mean, I think in reality, it, that it is going to be challenging to take x-rays on a lot of four or five year olds. But I certainly think by eight to 10, you should be attempting. Mm -hmm. And if they can't tolerate them, they can't tolerate them. But you've, you've tried and you've written in your notes that you've tried. So, you know, you've done your best and you've covered yourself and that's all you can do. So thou shalt take bite wings for children. Number yes. two, Lucy. Okay, number two, very similar, but I've, I've made it slightly separate. Thou shalt take bite wings on adults. So the reason I've made them separate is because it seems to me like this thing with children is a really, really specific thing that people just aren't bothering to take x-rays on children at all. So I've, I've put the adults slightly separately. It's a, it's a, I feel like it's a slightly different issue. People generally are better at taking bite wings on adults, but I really feel like they're not good enough. I, I do still see it far too often that people take them somewhat erratic erratically or, or, or still often it's not that unusual for me to see people who just for years and years and years and just don't take them at all. Mm -hmm. What I've seen a lot of Lucy in the practice I've worked in is that they like clockwork, but they're every two or three years and then they're like clockwork. So they, it doesn't change dynamically as a patient change. It doesn't become 18 months. It doesn't become annual for the right indications for higher care. Yeah. It just stays. Oh, it's been oh last time 2019 It's 2022. OK, it's been three years. Let's take it because we've got to cover ourselves or whatever. So it needs to be a bit more bespoke to the individual. It does. It does. So people seem to ignore caries risk. And like you say, they just take them too yearly for everyone. So the guidance is six monthly for high risk, um, 12 monthly for moderate risk and 24 monthly for low risk. 
So it is really important to, to pay attention to the caries risk. And another point that I find as well is you can take bite wings on patients who are pregnant. The guidance says mm -hmm. it's safe to do so. I personally, I always give patients the option. I let them know that the guidelines say it's safe to do so. So usually they will have it, but if, if they would rather not, then that's fine. I've offered it. I've given them the correct information about the guidance mm -hmm. that, that saying that it, it is safe. But at the end of the day, you know, we can't force patients to do anything. And if, if they choose not to, then that's their decision. Yep, absolutely fair. Number three, thou shalt. Okay, number three, thou shalt always be suspicious of a non-healing socket. So don't keep treating a socket as a dry socket when it's not healing beyond two weeks. You would be surprised the cases I've seen where even after two to three months, somebody keeps coming back to the practice, keeps having the socket irrigated and alpha gel put in. It's just not normal. I mean, why would you not think that something's up, you know, mm -hmm. two months after a tooth has been taken out when somebody keeps coming back? So the funny thing here is that in the NICE guidelines about oral cancer, non-healing socket does not get a mention. It's a bit of an anomaly. I, see, I really strongly feel it should be in there. I, I do feel that it, it is basic undergraduate knowledge. It was certainly something that we were taught at Sheffield. I, I was in my year, I'm, I'm sure you were as well. Probably and, by the same person, Mrs. Freeman at Yeah, Yeah, <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably. <laughs> and, it, and it was certainly in undergraduate textbooks. So I'm not sure why it's missing from the NICE guidelines, but it, it definitely should be. I've come across a few of these cases now. And when I think about my own practice, you know, you, you, you get patients who come back with a, a dry socket from time to time. Usually they calm, you'll um, irrigate the socket, put some alcohol gel in, they won't come back again. Occasionally they'll have to come back for a second time and, and you'll do that again. And I think maybe I can probably count the number of times on one hand that somebody's had to come back on three occasions to have a socket mm -hmm. dressing. And I would, I'm pretty sure that, that that's all been within the first two weeks from extraction. Yep. But beyond yep. two weeks, uh, that's not something I see. I don't see people coming back with problems with the socket after two weeks. And if I did, I would be concerned. So obviously it could be cancer, but it could also be osteomyelitis. It could be medication re related osteonecrosis. So, you know, MRONG. Mm -hmm. So and if, if it's not cancer, if it's osteomyelitis or MRONG, either way, you're going to want to get that referred ASAP. Yeah, I've seen a few uh, MRONGs, uh, but nothing like a cancer from a non-healing socket. But yeah, I've seen a few MRONGs and it, it's very simple to diagnose after three weeks where the mucosa is, is, is still not looking like it should be. And sometimes the patient's not even feeling in discomfort, but it's, it's observation that you've made because maybe the first few, few days that they were in discomfort, then you review them. And if it's still not looking better, get that referral sorted. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, either way, whether it's any of those things, the cancer, the osteomyelitis, the m whatever it is, you need to get that referred as soon as possible. Beyond two weeks, just get it referred. Don't mess around. It's because it's, okay. it's not normal. Uh, that's a simple, I think that's a simple and a self-explanatory one. Very good. Okay. Let's have number four. Number four. Thou shalt always be suspicious of sore patches on the side of the tongue or on the cheek. So mm -hmm. I see cases where people will come and that they'll complain that the side of the tongue is sore. And the dentist says, has a look in the mouth, mouth and, and writes in the notes that the, the cusps of the molars are rubbing on the side of their tongue. So they don't write that the cusps have fractured or a filling's broken or that there's any reason why these cusps are suddenly making the tooth sore when they never did before. But they take a burr mm -hmm. and they drill down the cusps a bit and they write that they've smoothed the cusps. And then the patient mm -hmm. comes back and the side of the tongue is still sore. So they, they write again or that the, the, the cusps are rubbing the tongue and they smooth it down a bit more. So this just makes no sense to me. If the cusps weren't rubbing the tongue before, why have they suddenly started doing it now? You know, mm -hmm. it, it just makes no sense. Similarly, with, with cheek biting, if, if somebody's got a lesion uh, at the back of the mouth and, it, and it, you think maybe they're biting their cheek, you know, you're going to review that. But if it seems to be a recurrent problem, do they just keep biting their cheek or is there something else going on? Is, is there mm. maybe an, an underlying mass that's pushing the tissues out so that they're getting bitten more often? Because the patient might actually say, I'm biting my cheek. 
but why have mm-hmm. they suddenly started biting their cheek when they didn't before? Don't just assume that because they say that they're, they're biting their, they keep biting their cheek, that it's as, as simple as they keep biting their cheek mm-hmm. and you need to drill the cusps down a bit. So yes, this is well, another... in, in those scenarios. If we were to pitch a guideline, like if someone does come in with uh, some sort of we suspect at the time uh, trauma from a, a broken tooth or sharp filling, and usually, hopefully, we'll see something sharp rather than just uh, you know smoothing out enamel. Basically, that that, that, that ha- that's not associated with uh, a fracture or wear or whatever. Yeah, uh, and then exactly, we yeah. s- w- see them again in two weeks is, is is a fair recommendation. You think? Yeah, yeah. See them again in two weeks, and 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 the problem is that I'm seeing cases where people are drilling down cusps on teeth where it's just the same cusps that have always been there and they're not broken teeth so there's no reason for this to happen and then when they come back and the the problem is is recurring or still going on then the dentist is is thinking still thinking that they keep biting and and and, and they're not realizing that there's something else going on so um yeah you, you need to be suspicious of of sore patches on the tongue and cheek even when the patient might say that they're biting their cheek or that they're catching their tongue you need to think why mm-hmm. always always there should be something not obvious just assume there. it's frictional trauma because that's what the patient said and that's yep. what the patient's yep. implying and you think why that why would that suddenly start happening out of nowhere Mm-hmm. See them again in two weeks and uh, if in doubt refer don't just keep smoothing teeth exactly exactly and especially when when the teeth weren't even broken. So there's no reason that 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 should suddenly be happening. Very good. Number five, please. Okay, number five. Thou shalt know how to deal with a hypochlorite injury. Oh, this is a good one. Yes. So one of the things that happen when I see these cases is, and I've seen a lot of hypochlorite injury cases actually, and they can be pretty horrific. They, and, and I see the patient's account of what happened and they describe how it felt. So they always, always describe that even though they're completely numbed up, the moment that hypochlorite hits the tissues, they feel an immediate burning and stinging sensation. So they'll immediately tell the dentist. They always say they immediately told the dentist when it happens. So they will tell you straight away. So when they tell you this, you need to get in there straight away and irrigate with water or saline. If the nurse needs to go to a different room to get some saline and it's gonna take them a few minutes to get it, just use your purified water that you've got from the chair, but just just get something in there and irrigate immediately. Just think of it, if you burnt your hand, you're gonna want to get that cold water on it straight away. Every second that that hypochlorite's in there, on the tissues, undiluted, it's causing damage and that will happen very fast. So you need to act really, really quickly and you need to really get in there with the irrigation and you're not going to irrigate for two or three minutes. You need to irrigate for 15 minutes with saline or water. Keep irrigating, keep irrigating, keep irrigating. So what happens if you don't deal with this properly, then people can end up having these areas of necrosis and ulceration of where it comes through the soft tissues, which look horrific. They look like they've had a facial trauma sometimes, it's bruising, it looks very nasty, very concerning for the family. Yeah, absolutely. They can have facial deformity. I've seen a couple of cases, say an upper premolar hypochlorite injury, where in the longer term, after all the initial healing, it's caused the, the tissue damage and fat necrosis that has been caused by the hypochlorite injury means that they have a dent in their cheek. Mm. So then the part of the claim can, can sometimes become having filler injections to repair, the fill out the dent in the cheek, and they, they will need to be repeated every couple of years for life. Lucy, just had a question while we're talking about this from uh, from Mark. Hi, Mark. Uh, Mark's asking, uh, when you irrigate with water, uh, any guidelines in terms of like, do you do it with pressure? Because, I mean, on that same note, when I uh, irrigate with hypochlorite, the safe technique I was taught is I don't use my thumb. I use my index finger. And I always find that's a, a safer way, less likely to put more pressure. It's a bit more controlled. But then perhaps when if, if I was to cause a hypochlorite or not cause, but if a hypochlorite accent was to happen, because sometimes anatomy uh, lends itself to it, uh, of the tooth, uh, and then uh, do I want to go in with pressure with the water, try and chase it down? I, I, are there any guidelines we can follow? Because it's a very scary thing if yeah. it happens. Yeah, I'm not sure that there's any, I haven't read any specific guidance telling you that, that when you're irrigating after it's happened, how much pressure to use. I would assume that, that you will need to use a little bit more pressure because if you're doing the, the, the super careful, gentle irrigation to try and stay in the canal and not go beyond the canal, that you will would do normally with the hypochlorite then yet yeah, then obviously that there's a risk that it won't won't get 
through the perforation perhaps that's happened or, or whatever yeah. it is, or the overprepared apex or whatever, you know, you're, you're going to need to get through that for it to actually get into the tissues and dilute the hypochlorite. Mm -hmm. So 15 minutes of uh, it, so saline 15 or minutes water. Of, so 15 minutes of irrigation, and then you want to give them a short course of... Uh, so what, what, what I, I've, so I've had a hypochlorite accident happen once, and luckily I dealt with it very well and the patient absolutely fine afterwards. I'd caused a small perforation, which luckily I was able to repair well and everything everything worked out. But but when it did happen, she immediately told me about this burning, stinging sensation. I immediately realized I did the copious saline and I... Um, was well, your I, heart racing? Were you, were you feeling because <laughs> yes, of the first time a little you did bit, it? So yeah. You must have been heart <laughs> in the mouth moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I wasn't happy it had happened, that's for sure. So I prescribed antibiotics to prevent any secondary infection occurring from the potential tissue damage. So short course of amoxicillin, three days, and a three-day course of dexamethasone. So a lot of patients with hypochlorite injuries end up in A&E later. And mm -hmm. quite, quite often they will be prescribed steroids in A&E. So I feel like let's, let's cut out the middleman and get them on it straight away because... They're going to benefit from that. I don't want them sitting yeah, around. I mean, I in Singapore, Lucy, I used to work in Singapore. We used to give it after, and it might sound extreme, we used to give it after, after surgical wisdom teeth. And from, from the papers I'd read at the time as well, it's great for reducing inflammation after uh, surgeries like that where yeah. it's quite involved. Yeah. Uh, now, I've never actually prescribed it in the UK. Any guidelines? Because I've read many indications to prescribe uh, DEX for, to, to help with uh, post-operative pain. Any guidelines to how you prescribe that? Do you keep some in the practice, in your pra practice? How does it work? No, I d don't keep any. So I've only had to do this the once. And mm -hmm. I probably, if, if I didn't do the dental legal work, I do, I wouldn't have done it because I wouldn't have known, but because I've seen it being prescribed in A&E when people have gone there after having hypochlorite injuries, I knew what they prescribed. Mm -hmm. I had made a note of it for future reference. And was it just a private needed. prescription? And, and, and yeah, it was a private prescription. Yeah. So it was four milligrams, three times a day for three days. Mm -hmm. So the Very patient good. was taking TDS for three days, both amoxicillin and dexamethasone. Mm -hmm. And I told her to use cold compress as well. And she was absolutely fine. No problems whatsoever. So Amazing. luckily that worked out. But also very important point to note as well is make sure that this is on your consent form. Because when a hypochlorite injury does occur and somebody hasn't been informed that this is a risk of root canal treatment before they agreed for you to do it, then it's going to be found potentially by the court that you didn't obtain fully informed consent. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give my slap on the wrist. And this is why we do this podcast. I'm learning all the time. I will, I will start to make a, a bigger, deal, bigger deal of it. Now, consent forms, if, if and when I do a consent form, I will actually go through it with the patient. I'll annotate it. And I'll make a point of, of, of going through that from after this podcast. So just talk, just not to spend labor on it for too long if it's a simple anatomy, but just talk about that sometimes the, the good stuff goes through and it can be burning. Let me know if you feel any burning. Yeah, I say that there's a very, very small risk of a chemical injury that can cause tissue damage or nerve damage. Because actually these, on my list, I think I didn't mention one, one of the things that can happen as well as the, the necrosis and the facial deformity, you know, a dent in the face, for example, is quite often a, an, an area of paresthesia. Um, that, that is quite a, a, a typical long-term outcome after these kinds of injuries. Yeah. It's, it's a rare thing, but it's a significant thing. That, that needs to be known. So it's a rare but significant thing that That's should be mentioned. That's why it's really important that when it does happen, you need to be prepared. Brilliant. Well, I, I will definitely change that by my practice. So that was a good one. I was a meaty one. I think people in the chat were a bit more engaged on the live. So guys, uh, I'm appreciating the engagement. Suleiman and everyone, uh, Mark, just any questions as we go along, please uh, bring them through. So just to summarize the five so far, guys, if you, in case you've just joined us. Number one was take bite wings for children. Number two was take bite wings for adults. Come on, guys. You know, don't just do it every two years. Look at the risk of the patient. Number three, Three was be suspicious of non-healing sockets. Number four was be suspicious of a sore tongue or a sore cheek and it's not affiliated with a sharp cusp or a broken filling and don't just keep smoothing it. Think what might be going on. Could something else be going on? And number five just now was a quite meaty one uh, is hypochlorite incidents. What to look out for, uh, what to do afterwards, are you flushing with the saline 15 minutes, antibiotics, steroids uh, and, and, and I guess we, we didn't talk about this but you know that's the kind of patient you want to invite the next day. That's the kind of patient you want to hold their hand, call them a phone and really just follow up and, and show them that you care. Yeah, absolutely. And um, what, what I didn't say, but I hope is obvious, is how to avoid doing it in the first place is, you, you know, use a side venting needle. Don't use too much pressure. And 
Don't drill through the root at any old angle to create a massive perforation and then pump hypochlorite through it hard. <laughs> which unfortunately some people do. Very, very sound advice. Okay, brilliant. So we'll pass the halfway point. Now, Zara just asked while we're on here, in your consent, okay, well, it's interesting. So Zara asked, in your consent, do you actually mention that hypochlorite is used? Now, interestingly, when I've seen this make the news, maybe you've seen the same article I had some years ago where it was like a Daily Mail thing, like dentists use bleach inside her tooth and caused all these issues. And like, how do you even uh, begin to talk about that kind of stuff? But so Zara's asking, thank you, Zara, is do you mention that you're using sodium hypochlorite? Hypochlorite. On my consent form, it doesn't say sodium hypochlorite, but it does warn of a chemical, I think it, it says uh, chemical injury caused by disinfectant. So, so I, sometimes I've told patients that, okay, we use bleach to clean out the, the, the bugs and they've been okay about it, but I, I can see that it's a little bit uh, of, of a funny thing. So I think, yeah, it's a chemical that can cause damage. That's a patient yeah. needs to know. It's a disinfectant. So fair enough. So thanks yeah. for answering that. Thank you, Zara, for asking. This episode is brought to you by the good guys at Enlightened Smiles, the premium brand of teeth whitening, who do a fantastic training seminar online for any dentist, even if you haven't used them before or you just want to learn more about good quality whitening. What are the parameters of success? What are the things to avoid? What about the tray designs, the gel concentrations? The A to Z is covered by that man, Dr. Payman Langrudi. So check out the training. If you literally go to protrusive.co.uk forward slash enlighten, wherever you are in the world, you can join this education for free. So check it out now, protrusive.co.uk forward slash enlighten. Payman and team, thank you so much for supporting this podcast. So number six, please. Okay, number six. Thou shalt not, please don't, sh thou shalt not use corsodil mouthwash as your root canal irrigant. <laughs> who is teaching Amen. this? Amen. Tell me, Jazz, who is teaching <laughs> this? Who is it? If we weren't taught that in Shepherd, were we? No, 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 no. Who no, is no, teaching no, no. people to use corsodil mouthwash to irrigate root canals? Because I'm telling you, a lot of people are doing it. That's like, what? Well, it's like 0.02% or 0.05%. It's 0.2. It's 0.2. Yeah. And it okay. is not effective at disinfecting root canals. It's a mouthwash. It is not a root canal irrigant. Now, there is... And it doesn't get rid of necrotic tissue either. Yeah. Now, there mm. is some literature that would support the use of 2% chlorhexidine mm -hmm. as a root canal irrigant. Now, that is 10 times stronger than chlorhexidine mouthwash. And you can buy 2% chlorhexidine for use as a root canal irrigant from endodontic suppliers. Mm -hmm. So that bottle of Corsodil mouthwash is not the same as that bottle from the endodontic supplier. One is 10 times stronger than the other. One will not kill anything in the root canal and one maybe will, but you should probably still use hypochlorite, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Very true. Uh, I mean, I, I had, I don't know if you saw this, I had Sanj on, uh, Sanj Bandari on uh, a, few, a few weeks ago on the podcast. Uh, we talked about acute pulpitis and how to, to manage patients quickly. And we talked a little bit about this and he says that, you know what, most dentists that do use uh, um, chlorhexine, they don't even use the good stuff. They don't use the 2%, they're just using uh, any old mouthwash. And, and like you said, that's not going to do anything. And I just want to take this moment to say, guys, unfortunately, Sanj uh, f felt a little bit unwell. He's okay, it's okay for me to tell you this. He He's been uh, very acutely unwell. We wish him all the best. He is stable. He is doing more positive. I'm not going to post group function 017 on post-op pain with him until I get the all clear that he's absolutely fine and, and doing well. So from the Petrusarati, we wish uh, Sanj a speedy recovery. We love you, mate. We hope you're doing okay and, and a good recovery. So yes, absolutely. Any other points on uh, not using chlorhexidine <laughs> as your irrigant? Yeah, a very interesting point here, which ties into my last point. I think the reason that people use corsodil mouthwash often as the irrigant is because they're worried about hypochlorite injuries. So I've just been talking about how you can potentially, although I wouldn't use 2% chlorhexidine um, as a root canal irrigant, but if you're going to do that, you should know that if you do use the 2% chlorhexidine, and you have a perforation and you inject that through a perforation, you will cause an injury that is identical to a hypochlorite injury. I had no idea. I had no idea. Absolutely. Wow. I have seen it in a, in a case that's, that's come across my desk and I've seen it in the literature as well. When working on the case, I've had to go back and look at the literature. So yeah, absolutely. It looks identical in the photos. Mm -hmm. You can't tell the difference. So. If you're a dentist who's afraid of using hypochlorite because you want to get that injury and you're using 2%, then there's no point. Yeah, exactly. You might as well just use the hypochlorite. The good <laughs> it's, stuff. It's going to be better anyway. Stuff. So just use hypochlorite. Use it sensibly. Use it carefully. 
Don't cause perforations, you know, be careful with what you're doing. Well, out on the street, Lucy, from speaking to lots of dentists, some dentists just don't use rubber dam. You know, they don't have rubber dam in the practice. They just don't do it. OK, and yeah. fine. It's the elephant in the room, you know. And, and so I think the reason why some people might use the mouthwash is because they're not using rubber dam and they just want to they want to irrigate with something. So that, what can I use that's safe with pulling around the mouth uh, and not having to just irrigate the canals with saliva? They're thinking, let me use uh, chlorhexine. But we all know we don't need to labor this point. It's not good enough. It's not good enough and it doesn't work. And to be honest, I, I don't think that the hypochlorite, if you're not using rubber dam, I don't think that's a reason not to use hypochlorite anyway. I mean, I've hypochlorite, when, when, certainly when it's happened to me, when it's leaked through a breach in the rubber, underneath the rubber dam, the, the patient's gone, oh, I can taste something, Ugh. you know, <laughs> you have to lift up the mm. rubber dam, it, wash it out underneath and suction it up and then make sure you've got your seal on your rubber dam. It's not causing any kind of injury because it's on the surface of the tissues. It's when you inject mm. it and it's going, you're injecting it into the bone. In the planes of the <laughs> basically, tissues. Basically, yeah. into yeah. the tissues. That's when it causes a problem. So if you're not using rubber dam, I mean, obviously you should be, but but that's not a reason not to, it doesn't stop you using hypochlorite, I would say. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. All right, number seven please okay number seven thou shalt do further charting when you have threes and fours on your bpe <laughs> <laughs> yes okay so yep. many 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 people out there um do their bpes they write the threes and the fours and then don't do anything more <laughs> now, now, lucy i'm just going to pause you for one second it's important to mention for the international audience and you know in the states correct me if i'm wrong lucy if you know this but in the colleagues i speak to in the states and also when i was in singapore speaking with dentists from the states there's no such thing as bpe like there, there's no basic periodontal exam they actually do six point charting or they assess the gingiva they look at the radiographs but there, there's no a basic screening tool like that so for those okay. internationally bpe is a basic periodontal examination it's got code from zero all the way to four. We're not, it's not going to be a tutorial on the BPE. You know, it's a screening tool. So once you've found through your screening tool that this patient has got a screened positive for potential periodontitis because you can't confirm that as a diagnosis without doing further uh, investigations, radiograph, etc. But yeah, we don't just screen. It's like screening someone of high risk of anything and then just leaving them to it. You've got to then probe further. Excuse Absolutely. The pun. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, if they've got threes and fours, they've basically got pocketing over 3.5 millimeters. So... When somebody has codes three and four, you don't have to do a six point pocket chart where you write in everything and you write all the ones and the twos. You don't have to do that. The guidance actually says you don't have to do that. You have to write the, the fours and the fives and the, you know, the sixes, the, the, the ones that are over three, mm -hmm. uh, and you have to write where they are. So um, personally, at my practice, we have SOE. So you go into the, se the six point pocket chart, you, you open a new chart, and you just have to put it in those isolated sites. And you know, most patients, it's just a few sites, it's not everywhere. You know, maybe sometimes with new patients who've, who've not been to the dentist for a long time, and, and they've got really widespread perio, you know, you might have quite a lot to do. But for a lot of your regular patients, it's just going to be a limited number Number of sites and you just need to re record where they are so you just put in those limited number of sites um, it, it really shouldn't take very long at all so again I am very aware that I work in private practice and that the, the time is a real issue for people who are working in NHS practice but if you are just putting in those isolated sites it's it, it's really very quick to do and amazing that's a very good uh, top tip there so that if, if you're a dentist who thinks that okay three means I need to now do the entire sextant it's not necessarily the case get find those deep pockets and then label them where they are and what number they are and so then you can repeat that in the future and it doesn't add to extra time to to the equation Exactly. And you might have a couple of code threes and it might literally be two teeth, one on the upper left, one on the upper right that have got a four millimeter pocket. And, you know, if you don't want to open up a chart, I mean, this isn't particularly guidance. This is just my personal opinion. You could just write in the notes, you know, four millimeter pocket MB for mesiobuccal upper left six, for example, and same for upper right six. But if you've written that descriptively in the notes, you're essentially recording exactly the same information that you would do on a perio chart for, for a very limited yep. number of sites like that, because it's showing somebody who's going to look at that, that there's a code three here because of that one pocket at that particular site on that particular tooth. And that's how deep it was. And that, that's mm -hmm. the information they need to know. Because otherwise, if you've got a code three, there, there could be pockets all over that sextant. So if, if you at least, when there's just a couple of sites, just, just write where they are and how deep 
deep they are. And if there's a few more, just, just pop them in, in a chart, but you don't have to do the whole chart. That's very good real world advice. Uh, and obviously it makes sense to do it in the official chart because in the future, two years down the line, it's so much easier to find than digging through notes. But it's a, it's a valid point that, you know, if you just had to, if there's just one pocket and you had to not do a chart for it, make a note, uh, be, be descriptive where it is. And, and that's good. Now we've got a, a question from Osama. Hi, Osama. Hope you're doing well, buddy. If the patient's seeing hygienist for perio, can we write it in the instructions to the hygienist? Now I'm thinking here, Lucy, immediately that ideally a practice needs to have a, a policy or a protocol for managing their perio patients who who does the pocket charting? How often do you guys do it? How do the dentists and the hygienists work together? That's the things kind of going through my mind. But how would you answer Osama's question in terms of can we just write the can we just delegate it to the hygienist? So you found let's let's make it really tangible. You found a code for upper right. Instead of doing the chart, can you now can you medically legally cover to say code for found inform patient Andrew the hygienist? Can you please do the six point charting next week when you see them? Yeah, I mean I think lots of people do that. Lots of people. It will particularly if they've got a hygienist that's working with nursing support then they'll book them back to have a full charting done by the hygienist and I think that's okay but I, I think if you are going to then send your patient off to the hygienist to have that full charting done then you're actually going to need to look at that charting because it's still on you then to do the treatment plan of exactly what their need is so you need to see the charting look at it together with the x-rays and, and then make your plan personally I do I do my six point chartings myself I want to know exactly where and record where all the pockets are myself for that's my own mm -hmm. peace of mind. So yes, you can delegate some of this to the hygienist, but you've got to remember that the buck's always going to stop with you. And, and that if, if they are going to do that pocket charting, you're still going to have to be looking at it because you're going to have to be deciding on exactly what that treatment plan is going to be. Good. So uh, you can delegate, but be don't, that doesn't mean that you're now not involved in the care anymore. You need to then go for the next step. So that's absolutely reasonable. Number eight, please, Lucy. Okay, so I kind of do my fingers now. Okay, number eight, number eight. Thou shalt not rely on only a single visit scaling without local anaesthetic on patients with increased pocketing. So, so if you've got a patient who's got widespread pocketing, then no one is going to be convinced that a single visit was sufficient. So even if you write in the notes that you've done periodebridement, if it's been done, if you've done your periodebridement in one visit, Everybody knows that that basically means you just did a scale and polish or maybe just a scale and not a polish. A gross scale. Mm. Yeah, a, a gross scale. I mean, a lot of it depends on time. It depends on how much time you've spent and exactly how many pockets there are. It might be actually that you had quite a bit of time that day and the number of pockets wasn't loads and you were able to go around really thoroughly with the ultrasonic, then go around with hand scalers as well. And you've done a thorough job as, as was needed and, and could have been done in the time. But if, if that's the case, you're going to have to document that very clearly. But on the whole, when you see, you know, and I see a lot of these cases with patients with code threes and fours, and they've just had a single visit where it's, you know, they've just had a, it, it might be called a scaling, it might be called a period of debridement they, they might have written root planing uh, i mean there's root surface debridement that there's and, and of a, course a deep now clean. a deep deep clean deep clean this <laughs> and of course now we have the new term don't we pmpr professional mechanical plaque removal this is not my favorite term i don't know what you think of it <laughs> <laughs> it's just mumbo jumbo <laughs> i mean okay patient. so but to me that term just says you're going to remove the plaque and leave the calculus behind really i mean <laughs> really on on some of those patients that come in with all that calculus cakes everywhere you're just going to remove the plaque and leave the calculus is that what they mean i don't know Surely, it, surely not. But uh, you're right. It's, it's confusing. It's a bit term. of a strange term, I think. It's a strange term. I don't like it. I think I quite like periodebridement myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, same root surface debridement is what I taught. I like periodebridement. Now, it's, it's, it's so many times I've seen patients with code fours, and I can see that the history of code fours has been continuous. And I ask him, have you ever had local anaesthetic before? to have a deep clean and whatnot. They go, no, I've never, I haven't had a local anesthetic for, since the last time I had a filling, 15 years ago, kind of thing. And, and in my perception of the world at the moment, if they haven't had LA, have they really had a thorough debridement? That's how I see it. Maybe I'm wrong, and Lucy, I'm happy for you to say, no, actually, Jazz, you can do a deep, good, good job without LA. Where do you stand on that? Okay, well, I would say it does sometimes surprise me <laughs> how how much you can get away with cleaning deep pockets without local anesthetic and the patient doesn't seem to flinch and you know yes, I can be pretty I've experienced thorough. that myself so, you're right. so yeah that that does surprise me having said that one of the things that I've noticed as I've become more experienced in my career maybe I just get 
frustrated with damn perio and it not getting better that i've become pretty brutal i want i want <laughs> my, my yeah my perio is brutal i mean i yeah i want them to be really numb because i'm going to be really brutal and i feel yeah. that that's the best way to get a good result so i wouldn't want to do what i do when, when i do when i see patients who, who've got quite a lot of pockets and i i get them back for two visit perio debridement and I do, you know, within the same week, I'll do right side on one day and left side on the other day and I'll, you know, numb them up on one side, go with it and be pretty brutal and then do the same on the other side. So that's how I usually manage it. It's not a practice builder, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, it reminds me of a practice to work in Oxford. And I used to work with these wonderful hygienists. Uh, shout out to, to Morgan and Lou if you're listening. Absolutely brilliant what they do. You know, really, really good uh, forward thinking hygienists. Uh, and then when they'd have to refer to a periodontist for, for the tough patients, the patients come back saying they just did the exact same thing you did, except they, they scaled me to within the inch of my life. Like they literally, the periodontist, the only thing they, the periodontist did different was extremely thorough. Like, like not, yeah. not, not, no, thorough is not the right word. Aggressive and brutal is... Yeah. Yeah, is the right brutal. term, I think. <laughs> so, yes, I think I completely agree with you. I think that's the difference. Yeah. And the other thing that I think really helps me with perio is my loops. I think mine are 5.5 or 5 uh, magnification and, and the light as well. I blow, well, when I've been scaling, then I blow air down to the pocket and it kind of blows it open and I can see right down the pocket. It's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing how much subgingival calculus uh, you, you can spot. Yeah, but I mean, years back when I was newly qualified and I wasn't working with loops and I, I had no idea I was working in the dark, really. Whereas now I can, I can see right down the pocket. It's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely agree. We're almost coming to 10, guys. Uh, number nine, please. Okay, number nine. Thou shalt not underestimate ID nerve injuries. So okay, we, all know, we, we all know about ID nerve injuries. So what we probably know about them is that when you take wisdom teeth out, the patient might end up with a numb lip and it probably will be temporary, but it could be permanent. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that most people know a lot beyond that. So one of the things that I've learned from doing the, the dental legal work is I have seen a lot of patients give their accounts to me in person, or oh, wow. I've, I've read their accounts. Like you've interviewed them? Yeah, when, when they've come to see me for examinations. And, and, and I've seen their accounts written down of the impact that an, an ID nerve injury has had on them. So of course, it's not necessarily that they end up with a numb lip, they might have paresthesia, so they might have disturbed nerve sensation. They might have dysesthesia. That's a difficult one to say, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. So they might have um, a painful disturbed nerve sensation. So can you imagine if you have damaged your ID nerve and you're getting continuous severe shooting nerve pains? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you live with that? It's just awful. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you know Corey Fran, a fantastic dentist, someone I really admire. He, he, he was lecturing once and he described these patients uh, from what he'd seen. And he says that it's like pinching your lower lip and really just pinching it for a minute and then feeling what that feels like. And this is how some patients will describe how they're living constantly, as if there's a pressure on their lip, basically, from his account of, of, of the patients he's spoken to. So I absolutely agree. This is really a big, big issue for the patients that suffer with this nasty complication. So the, the other things that they say, almost always say, is that they don't eat out anymore because they can't tell if they've got food on their chin. And wow. that's quite sad. I mean, it, that's a big part of their social life. It's just it's too embarrassing for them because they just can't tell when they've got food around mm -hmm. their mouth or on their chin. So they're just too embarrassed. I, I have the same issue, but with my moustache. <laughs> yeah. But I, I've learned I've learned yeah. to deal with it. Yeah. And, and I've got cl close enough friends that will just say, just, just over here. But yeah. yeah, if you get it on your face and you don't have a, a beard like me, yeah, it, that, that's a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. And so another thing that I've seen come up a lot as well is that they don't want to kiss their partner anymore because it feels weird and uncomfortable and they don't like it. And mm -hmm. they consistently report that it puts a strain on their relationship. So yeah, absolutely. Who'd have thought that? You don't think about these things, but it's you know it, it impacts people's lives so much. I, I can't under you know underestimate how big the impact of these injuries is on people's lives. I've actually come across somewhere where an ID nerve injury was referred to as the suicide injury. Now I'm, I can't wow. remember where that came from, and I don't know mm -hmm. whether there are documented cases of people actually committing suicide because they couldn't cope with this injury. But I think that the takeaway from that is that it is a pretty horrendous injury to have. So don't underestimate it. So the take home there is just don't go anywhere near the ID nerve 
and avoid ID blocks if possible, because I have seen a lot I, of... I was just going to ask you about that, because Tara Renton is obviously uh, quite, quite big in saying that, OK, we've got to be really careful with our ID blocks. Uh, they're a big yeah. source uh, of, of problems. Yeah, I've seen um, loads of I them. I probably do... Yes, I was going to ask you, in terms of the injuries that you've seen, were they what percentage were from like the, the standard culprits like tricky wisdom teeth, tricky surgery, orthognathic surgery, and what percentage of them of them were the harmless ID block? I would say probably at least a third would be ID blocks. Wow. Rather than surgery. As many as that. I think. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean just, just avoid ID blocks where you can. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you do any ID blocks in, at the moment? Yeah, I do. I do. I don't use articane. I know that the literature is a, a bit up and down about the significance of that. I use Cytonest for my ID blocks, actually. I okay. find I find mm -hmm. that works better than Lignospan. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure from the literature whether that's that's better, but it certainly doesn't seem to be worse. It, I, I mean, maybe people use it for ID blocks less, but I haven't really seen cases where using Cytonest has been associated with ID nerve injuries. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I, I, you know, when it comes to ID blocks, I'm probably doing around about, and I'm working four and a half days, I'm very wet fingered. I'm probably doing about one a month at the moment. I do oh, a really? fair few okay. extractions, wisdom teeth. I'm doing a lot with infiltrations of articane. Uh, shout out to Janice Boyd from Canada, who motivated me to take the step to do like, you know, lower second molars with just articane, buckle and lingual. And I'm getting fantastic results of that. Um, so that's working well in my hands at the moment. So I'm doing less and less and less ID blocks. So uh, yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I'm trying it, to avoid it, them, but I'm still doing a lot more than you. So <laughs> obviously yeah, I need to yeah. work on that. You know, when I just heard what Janice was doing in Canada and, and, and she really gave me the confidence, like she's doing second molar extractions under just uh, infiltrations of articane. So wow. that really gave me the step like, hey, you know what, let me test the limits here. And so far I've, uh, I've only had one where I just had to top it up um, with an ID block. But most cases, especially for like cracked teeth, I've been doing a lot of, you know, second molars quite commonly get cracked. I've been dealing with all exclusively exclusively with articane infiltrations, making sure I go into the attached gingiva, making sure I see it sort of mm, spread up like a ranula, basically uh, buckly to so the collection of the anesthetic. So it's kind of like a subperiosteal uh, yeah, and sometimes yeah. going lingually as well. And, and that really has worked well in my hands. So uh, mm -hmm. that's a very good one. So I'm just going to summarize uh, number six to nine before we do the big reveal of the last one. It may or may not have any significance of being the last one, but but hey-ho. So we left off number five with how to deal with a hypochlorite injury and how debilitating they can be. Six was stop using core steel mouthwash as your uh, endodontic irrigant. Come on, guys, we know that already. And number seven was if you've screened for periodontal disease and you found an issue, i.e. got code threes and fours in the BPE, which we so endear in the UK, don't just ignore that. Follow up, do some pocket depths. And the big, big takeaway there was, you know, you can do isolated pockets, which is very good. And number eight is if someone's just had a scale and polish a single appointment for their full-blown periodontal disease. Is that really sufficient? Probably not. So, you know, let's get the full therapy for them. Uh, and don't underestimate ID nerve damage. And, uh, you know, Lucy described that uh, about a third uh, of the injuries uh, anecdotally that she's seen were from just the quote-unquote harmless ID block. So uh, something very good to note there. So, Well, just, very, just one, one more little point, just before we move on to number 10 that I was going to say sure. about the ID blocks is that, you know, obviously don't go curetting the base of a socket when it's close to the nerve. But another one that I think is not so obvious is that when you take a PA of a tooth before you're going to maybe do an endo, often on the PA you might see the upper border of the ID canal, but not the lower border. And because you're not seeing the double tram line, the upper border on its own might not be quite so obvious. So sometimes mm -hmm. you, you might end up doing an endo with the tooth with roots and, and actually, people think it's the eights that, that are sitting on the ID nerve, but there's there's plenty of sevens, sixes, and even fives that, that have the apex basically look in the nerve canal on the radiograph. So you can end up doing endos on the on those teeth, and you can cause ID nerve damage on those teeth as well. So you're, you're going to have to be very very careful with your endo files when when you yep. are working on those teeth, and and obviously with with implants, I mean just have a massive, massive safety zone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and with the with the periapical radiographs that we take for uh, endodontics, and make sure that you can see sufficiently uh, beyond the apex to make that sort of assessment yeah. on, on a first molar, on a second molar. Now, on, on the chat, our good friend uh, Andrew Miles from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, I think it's Trinidad. Is it Tobago? One of them. Uh, hello, Andrew. Uh, he says, um, there are rare cases, rare cases of emphysema in the neck and mediastinum due to forceful air aspiration around lower teeth. So puffing air in pockets should be done with that awareness. So just be careful, guys, uh, when you do that. Fair point. Good point, uh, yeah. 
Mark uh, again, hello again. Mark says, how many ID blocks I've done in the UK per year? Probably a, a shit load. Yeah. Uh, Trinidad, <laughs> I, I, okay, I Andrew Mars. Yes, I don't, I don't <laughs> know probably if that's, yeah. But probably, probably but less and less. Lot, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing we're turning more towards articane infiltrations. Yeah. So uh, number 10, Lucy. Okay, so number 10, thou shalt always palpate for canines at age 10. So, Preach. Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, if they're not there, just refer. Don't keep seeing them till they're 15 and they've still got their Cs, by which time the impacted canines uh, are like this over the roots of the ones and twos and have resorbed half the roots of the ones and the twos. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, that seems to be another thing that, that, that people aren't that hot on. They're, they're not palpating for canines. The basic thing to do, I think the big takeaway here, guys, is Start implementing it tomorrow, but how will you implement it? In your examination template for child exam, is it even there? Is, it, is that even entry? If it's not an entry, it's never going to happen. So if just the simple, tangible next step, the logical next step is make sure canines palpated, question mark, Y stroke N, and then delete the one as appropriate and do that for every patient at age 10 and above. And I've got a few stories here. Like I thought that um, if I find any concern at around about age 11, 12, because it's the first time I've seen that child, and I'm thinking, oh, by the time I refer them through orthodontists, they'll see them for a year. But actually, it doesn't have to be like that. If you email your uh, orthodontic practice, your NHS orthodontic practice, they're actually very sympathetic towards this. And they will reply back saying, okay, we'll make an urgent arrangement for them. So I think pursue that avenue to to get it assessed by the orthodontist, uh, where it's a good idea to do so. Uh, and the other one is a story is, um, I, I used to treat this uh, fairly well-known international celebrity in Oxford, uh, and I saw his daughter come in, and oh my goodness, it was just, you know, the, the, they weren't threes, they were Cs. And she previously had all these uh, teeth charted as permanent canines all these years. So I had to break the news that actually there's a big bulge in the palate and it's a big issue. So then it starts a whole fiasco um, and like how that. Old was so she? Lucy, please, she was 14. Right, absolutely. And the thing is with these is that if you get to them quickly, they can the alignment can often spontaneously improve, or if it, if it doesn't and they still need to intervene, that you know that they can expose them, attach the gold chains, drag them down. The longer you leave it, the less likely it is that that's going to work. Mm -hmm. And in terms of guidelines, and here's something that I probably need some advice from you on is I'm always seeking orthodontist guidance on, on this kind of stuff. Even though I've got a diploma in ortho, I do say, okay, let me just get the orthodontist opinion. Should we extract the C's or not? Uh, and their advice usually is to do it. Now, should I be making that judgment call myself? So when I see that, uh, okay, they're, they're 10, I can't palpate the canines, uh, buckly or palatally. And uh, so should I then be saying to parents, okay, let's get a uh, little Tommy in and remove the C's. Should I be making that call? Or, or should I get that uh, call facilitated by the orthodontist? Personally, I would always check in with the orthodontist in a case like that. Yeah. It's peace of mind for me. I feel happier that, that we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Uh, I think if you're concerned about the age and they're like more 11, 12 and you're worried, then do an urgent referral and, and get their opinion. Like I said, just take some photos. An OPG is good because they can give the orthodontist some more information. So, if, you know, first thing you could do is maybe take an OPG, attach it to that email through the orthodontist and, and just get some opinion. And you don't have to like wait a year for them to get seen about this canine issue. It is slightly more of a time sensitive issue. Uh, would you agree? Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, you can use your parallax technique as well. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Very true, very true. So brilliant. So the, the last 10 ones there is palpate the canines, the permanent canines at age 10. Uh, they should be palpable or buckly. If you feel them palatally, feel a platal bulge, uh, then yeah, it, it kind of is, is going to be uh, impacted at that stage. Uh, so try to start having that relationship with the orthodontist to, to discuss these cases. So that's been a really good summary of the 10 commandments. So we'll, we'll get them written up and emailed to everyone as well. Uh, and this will come out on the, on the podcast proper. Now, guys, if anyone's got any questions for, for Lucy, who's kindly given up her time tonight to discuss discuss all her wisdom for seeing all these cases and all these uh, experiences that she's had. Uh, we welcome any last questions that you have. Uh, Lucy, any, any points on any of those um, 10 commandments that you feel now that we've, we've talked about it that you want to go back and add, add something to? I'm not sure really. I mean, I think that the, the biggest ones where I think people just apparently they don't know that they're meant to be taking, it, it sounds bizarre, but they don't know they're meant to be taking bite wings on kids. I, I'm not quite sure how that works, but it, that seems to be the case. I think they just it's, don't do it for so long because they b b bad, uh, bad habits and they, mm. they kind of just forget. And dentistry can be very isolated. And if you're, you know, if we're all going on the composite veneer courses, and Invisalign courses, and no one's going to the uh, update in radiography guidelines courses, yeah. then oh, we, yeah. we don't, we don't yeah. get exposed yeah. to yeah. it. Exactly. Right? So these podcast sessions like this are yeah. very important to remind everyone. Yeah. And, and the, the other one, this, this thing with the, using corsidor mouthwash as a root canal irrigant, I just, 
it, it seems like somebody must be teaching it because I don't understand why so many people are doing it. But but who would be teaching it? So I'm just uh, I don't know quite how it got started and, and how it became so widespread. I was going to name the parent company, of course, still, but I'm not going to do that in case this podcast gets sued. So I'll, they're, they're definitely not teaching it. Don't worry. Yeah. It's not for that indication. I'm not I'm not going to get sued by a multi-million corporation. Uh, yeah. Suleiman asked, uh, how did you get involved? This is one for you, actually, Lucy. Um, how did you get involved in dental legal work? And any tips for those considering exploring it uh, as an additional career avenue, please? Thanks, James. Well, <laughs> Funny story, but true is one year I, I got I got my my quote through for my annual up, update with dental protection, and yet again it had jumped up again, you know, to some astronomical figure, even though I wasn't making any claims, and I just thought, wow, it's so much money that you know there must be so many claims going on, and then I thought, hmm, maybe maybe there's a potential avenue for here, <laughs> avenue here. Mm -hmm. For for me, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe if there's that much going on there, maybe it's something that I could become involved in and, and that's what gave me the idea. And to get involved in it, I just sort of started, I, I had no, I didn't knew nothing about it. Didn't know what, what, what to do or in what way to get involved. I just started Googling. I was a re really lovely guy who's, who's retired now called Mike Young, who'd, who'd written a book. Did he also write that book, uh, Managing a Dental Practice, The, the, the Genghis, the Genghis Conway? Conway? Yes, yes, yes. He's such a lovely guy. So, so helpful and supportive. Great, great mentor. Really happy to help anyone out and give advice. Active on Twitter, if but I remember. It, yes, yes. I mean, he's completely, completely stepped away. For, completely, completely retired okay. now. But he was really helpful to me a few years ago. Um, and he introduced me to other people who were also really, really helpful. We have a, a lovely WhatsApp group of people. There's about 80 of us in, involved in dental legal stuff now in this whatsapp group that, that chat together and you know there's always new people joining and getting a warm welcome from the group um giving each other tips so i mean if someone wants to take the next step in terms of what to google or which courses they need to do i you know a formal degrees or, or how to get a flavor of it how can they start it, it it depends on on exactly what you want to do whether you want to work for a, an indemnity provider as a as a dental legal advisor whether you want to be an expert witness or whether you want to become doubly qualified uh, as, as some people do and, and become a solicitor or a barrister that there's lots of different routes um, there's the llm qualification in law that, that some people do there are various courses um, you can go on there's a company called Bon Solon that, that, that does courses on report writing and, and cross-examination skills. Um, so you can do certificates and diplomas. So th th there's lots out there. Brilliant. Well, uh, if anyone wants to send you an email or uh, get get support from you, any anything that they could, any way they can reach out to you? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, you, you can look Fa me up. Facebook, Twitter, where's a, where's a quick, easy place to go? Instagram, what do you prefer? It's easy to find. My email's on my website. You just Google me. <laughs> okay. Yep, yep. I did Google you and I saw your website. Very nice. Lucy, thank you so much for giving up your time. Uh, to talk Pleasure. about these 10Ks. Thanks for preparing it. Thanks for being mindful about it. Thanks for leveling us all up, including me, because uh, there's a few points that I really learned on as well, and I'm going to implement straight away. Because, guys, no knowledge is nothing without implementation. So if it's the fact that you're not palpating the canines because it's not in your notes, it's not in your checklist, simple thing to do. And now we know how to manage a hypochlorite incident, so hopefully it never happens. When it does, you'll remember Lucy and this podcast. Uh, Lucy, thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate you getting up a Wednesday evening. Let's face it, you'd rather be here than uh, the cold, murky weather outside. It's miserable today. So thanks for joining us and uh, check it out again when it comes on Spotify, Apple, etc. If you're on the app, this will be very much suitable for CPD, so you'll be able to get uh, CPD. Uh, just scroll down, click the answer a few questions on the type form, uh, and, and that'll be there with you. Lucy, any final words? Um, no, I just would like to say thank you very much for having me. It's been a real pleasure to be on. You've been very fun to talk to. Thank you so much. Well, there we have it, guys. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. What changes are you going to make tomorrow morning to make sure that we don't fall foul of these little issues that can become a big medical legal hassle for us in the future. My main takeaway was how I'm going to manage something hopefully that is never going to happen to me, but let's face it, it could, it probably will happen in my in my career is a hypochlorite incident, right? And I, I have more information about how to manage that, learn more about dexamethasone and in those uh, severe cases that their, their role and, and how it might have a role in those severe cases. So hope you gain a lot from that. Listen, you've got an associate, a principal that you feel should listen to this episode. Please send this to them, right? Share the love, pay it for uh, and once again, don't forget on the app to answer those questions, get your CPD right now, because let's face it, you've listened all the way to the end. I'm so thankful you deserve some CPD. Anyway, I'll catch you in the next episode. Same time, same place. Bye.